was fantastic. It was just, it was a sight to be seen. It wasn't just a way of earning a living, it was, it was so embedded in the families and in the lifestyle and in the community. The smell of the river, that's something that'll live on you forever. We were farmers. Yeah, we produced a product. Thanksgiving and Christmas, I don't think we ever took them off. We have an incredible legacy here and oyster families that built so much. They were, they were real business people, you know. Just takes you back to your childhood and how blessed you were. I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. Like I said, I had no headaches out there. <laughs> it was quite a time. We worked hard and played hard and lived a beautiful life. What's interesting, I guess in historical perspective, is um, how folks in the Delaware Bay decided to embrace oyster planting and, and embrace it uh, as enthusiastically as they did. Spring bay season, bringing them down, planting them, and then in the winter time, uh, dredging them up and, and selling them. So you had to catch it twice to sell it once. You uh, went up the bay May and June. Uh, you overhauled your boats over the summer and beginning September, people start to harvest. Similar to farming, you uh, hope for the best, but it doesn't uh, turn out that way a lot of times. We dredged off the natural beds for the seed and planted it on our own bottom, and then in the wintertime, dredged off of our own bottom. And you had to get in every day that you could. I mean, you only had so many days. When you started, you'd do pretty good, and towards the end of the season, it would slack up. And that was your uh, money for the year. You would plant them on your ground. If you didn't uh, do good up the bay, you weren't gonna do good in the winter. But you were not in a hurry in the winter time like you were in the spring. Because it's up there, so you gotta get all the seed you can get. Our crews, they come up from Maryland. When Dad needed the crew, he would send the word out down there and he would hire in as many Eastern shoremen as he could. Because they were good oystermen, they were tongers, they all knew how to handle oysters. They would come here and they would stay here, like you say, the whole week. Stay, stay on the boat overnight, every night and eat on the boat. They came here to work. They wouldn't go back every week. They would send their money home and they would stay for months at a time. Separate the shells from the oysters was a primary job. Two, six, e. Their secondary job was to handle the sails and reef when the captain wanted them reefed. They used to ring a bell. You'd heave one ding, you'd heave the lee, I think, and two dings, you'd heave the, the winter dredge. So I tell people I'm a farmer and I plow all the time, but I can't see my plow. <laughs> it's really almost like choreography to know how long to leave the dredge in, when to start the next one. Yeah, there is a little finesse to it. I mean, you're turning, the time you want to wind. It's, it's up here, and it's just, it's just there. You, you get a feel for it. I'm guessing, but I would say you ought to be moving about a walk to dredge. And that's the way they controlled the speed when they were dredging. They, if they were going too fast, you took a reef. And if you weren't going fast enough, you'd let it shake it out. Coming up of the dredge over the side is the time when the people have to start getting engaged and, and manhandling it. Two, two guys on each side of the dredge. You know, you're taking a dump it. Then we get down on our knees and, and had the wild baskets and we'll pick them up and put them in the basket. There's a moment where you kind of have a sense of whether it's a good haul or whether it's mostly shell. And some would be single. Then some would be all hooked together. And you had to use a hammer to knock them loose before you put them in the basket. An oyster boat 
to be satisfactory had to be shallow. Because of operating around Delaware Bay, you know, to get in and out of the Marsh River, if you were over six feet, you were too deep. They had to have a lot of deck space because you carried your oysters on deck. It was kind of neat to think that boat was around before the Civil War. The cashier was here that whole time, and she had a following. You know, she was known. She was somebody. She was she was a vessel that um, had a legacy. The old oyster boats, which had a clipper type bow with hollow water lines, that's the original oyster boat. Then, about I don't know, 1925 or somewhere in there, they started building a spoon bow boat, which the mirror walls a spoon bow boat and uh, they were faster, bigger. Designed to be easily operated by just a few people. And, you know, so that gave more time to be sorting oysters and doing the other work. I think it's a great design boat, and for a boat that was designed for the Delaware Bay, you know, I find it, you know, we've had it out in the ocean a number of times. Nothing like super scary weather, but its motion is very nice. Yes. Mm, the good stuff. Yeah, we all had cooks on the boat. Most of them were pretty good. The cook was a valuable man. You had eggs for breakfast every morning, and a, a thing that I've never had since that we always had on the boat in, for breakfast was fried bologna. Fried bologna sandwiches. They were hot. They always had fried bologna. Baked beans with the hot dog, fried chicken with the fried pork chops. One of the good things was the skipper always ate first. <laughs> Sometimes you can smell the food all across the water. It smells so good. <laughs> I always hated the fog in the winter time when the decks got iced up. Very dangerous. The river was froze over, and uh, they would use dynamite to break the ice. And then even after they broke the ice, uh, one boat would uh, have to cut through to make the path because there were still large chunks. So we had to have the oysters for Christmas. And uh, I went out there by myself, should have known better. And uh, I stepped down on the deck, boy, I took one and I <laughs> broke my arm out there. But I got the oysters. He left that morning on his boat. He left our house with money on the table for our school lunches, as he always did. And he left, and he didn't come back anymore. Things started to change during the Second World War. The biggest change was to change from sail to power. No question about that. Boats went to power, dredging and on the, on the seed beds, and um, the, there was a lot of changes that took place on up through, to, including the 70s, when, when actually, you know, most of the, all the crews were done away with. They had to do it. You just couldn't get people to handle sailboats and do the things that had to be done to make them go. Luther Jeffries and I got an idea that we would try to figure out a way to call oysters automatically without the crew. And he came up to the shipyard and talked about it. I said, well, we'll, we'll build a test model. It was a little cage like you see on these that we turned by hand. And I was shocked. The oysters came out one way and the shells came out the other. I couldn't already believe it. At about the same time, George had the idea. If you have real thin shell, that shell's going to fall through to the bottom part of it. Good oysters will stay on the upper part of it. It would go from a plain conveyor up to the column machine now, and then on into that, and then it come up over onto another conveyor and load the boat. It saved a lot of time. I, I guess due to the way that the industry has changed, again, a lot of them have went back to the to the hand calling um, 
you know, non-mechanized dredging like more so back in the old days. You know, we switched over in, in the in middle 90s to, to a quota system after MSX and, and Dermo and that, that, you know, we had to change the way the fishery was managed. Nineteen fifty-seven and then fifty-eight and fifty-nine were very, very high mortality years. They lost up to ninety percent of the oysters down in the lease beds, and up to fifty to seventy percent on the seed beds, which are now where the fishery operates. Right around the time when it was looking like there was going to be massive success and MSX resistance was here and the oysters can come back and be healthy, Dermo moved in. Um, and it's this other disease. It's very similar in that it's a single cell parasitic organism that kills oysters, but it's different in the sense that the oysters for some reason are not becoming resistant. We're doing all right. I mean, it, we, we got a good product. We're we're getting uh, you know the, the notability that we deserve, I think. And and you know people are you know people are asking for Jersey oysters and and um, it's it, it's all good despite the challenges. I think it's important not just nostalgically to look back and say how it was, but in order to take care of and preserve and be good stewards of what's here today, it really helps to recognize the history and to be respectful of the things that were in the past. The history of what's gone on and, and the ability for me as an ecologist to be able to touch back to that history is invaluable. Hoping that people you know, get out in the water and see the beauty of being out there and you know, connect to our area, maybe take that drive down to Bivalve and uh, come and visit.